Will's like, let's just talk about bourbon and shot callers. <laughs> that, that works. That's what I need to get as a bourbon sponsor, honestly, or tequila. Yeah. Ooh, tequila. Bourbon. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Crap, what were we talking about? That's the problem when I'm not on medication. Um, you know, with, with jigs and stuff, it's just, I don't know. I just don't see a lot of tournaments. I used to fish jigs all the time, and now I'm more like, I'll throw a shaky head on a bait caster because I feel like you know, if I'm fishing a tournament situation, I'm going to get bit more. Yeah. But I don't know if it's just seasonal or what the deal is with the jig. So I would say seasonal, yes. Lake and like type of lake you're on. So Highland Reservoir is obviously going to have rock on it. So there's going to be more crawdads and stuff as opposed to like, you know, Sampy Cooper and, and marshlands and the orange, you know, orange Texas area and Sabine and all that crap. But obviously a jig's versatile in the form of it's a bluegill or it's a crawdad, um, depending on how you rig it. But I'm with you, man. I catch way more fish on a shaky head than I do on a jig. And on top of that, I mean, um, I fish pretty fast. Uh, so for me to go down a bank, like we were just practicing tonight and, you know, we were joking that I need to put the trolling motor on three. Like that's almost impossible um, for me. So the jig fishing stuff, I like throwing it like bluegill, like kind of that late September, them chewing on bluegill for the last little bit while they're on the docks. That's usually when I'm catching my biggest ones. Um, and some big ones in the winter, like dead, dead a winter. But again, you're bundled up, you're crawling it along the bottom. Um, so we'll see. It's full moon. Full moon was Wednesday. We have the tournament on Sunday. Um, it's definitely, you know, cranking's the deal. There's some jerk bait fish. There's even some deep, like very wintry, um, Demiki rig spoon type fish. But I think the tournament's probably going to be one kind of that crawdad burrowing up in the rocks, um, type of jig approach. So now creeping on your Instagram, like, are they in that full winter pattern yet or are they slowly transitioning? Cause it's been a weird couple of weeks. It has been a weird, probably two months. I think I'd have to remember exactly when we did the first podcast, but the fishing definitely has been on a, on a super roller coaster. I think it got cold right after we talked and mm -hmm. I started smashing them pretty good. Um, and then it got hot again. Water was back up. We're just playing around with like 53 degrees on a Garmin, which on a Lawrence and hummingbirds, like 55. Um, that's, that's behind in my opinion. So with it being that kind of up and down, I think a lot of those fish, um, went out and suspended and I don't think they're going to come back. We never really had that Creek back of Creek, like chatterbait trap, scrounger head fluke bite. Um, it was more of like channel swing banks, secondary points, and they never pushed fully back. And now, you know, I'm seeing bait in 60 feet where the stripers are just chasing them around and that bait's never, that bait's not going to run in the back anymore. So mm -hmm. specifically at Smith, uh, we definitely had another weird winter. If it blows, you can go crank on them. You can go throw a jerk bait on them and you're going to catch 16 to 20 pounds. If it's dead calm, it's, it's not taking a lot to get into the check range. So I'm um, just to make sure I heard correctly then, you were just fishing the jig just because of that full moon. It wasn't like you were just trying to force the bite or anything like that, right? Yeah. Yeah. We're, um, mentioned this in the last podcast to that analytical part, moonrise, mm -hmm. lunar rise and fall during the day, three days before a full moon, full moon, and three days after is usually the best fishing for the month for me. Um, it's for me out here. And then what's coinciding right now is we're finally tipping that water temperature where crawdads are running to the bank because they're going to burrow. So, what should be like a early November, mid November type deal is now happening. We're in the middle of December and it's just starting to where probably the next three weeks, if you come out on a windy day, the next three weeks and chuck a jig and chuck a, you know, a crawdad kind of crankbait, you're, you're probably going to have a pretty good day out here for the next couple of weeks. I still don't know if I could still throw a jig. It's so funny because like in, in, in high school, when I was fishing high school tournaments, going into college, I really tried to practice the jig because the coaches sure. we had said you had to to win. Yep. But it's just like, I don't know. I, I truly feel like it's just evolved past it where it, it's the same thing. Like, I, and I've had, I had, a, I'm 
we pre-recorded Nico, a guy that runs Nico Bates, and he talked about this with the chatterbait a little bit. Like, I, he doesn't think fish will get conditioned to it, but I'm like, dude, you go into the Potomac River, everyone's cranking the chatterbait. There's no way yeah. you can tell me that those fish aren't getting educated. And I feel like it's with the jig too, why the shaky head took over a little bit. You know, yeah. they're not stupid. <laughs> yeah, no, and I think, um, I think there's definitely like yearly swings where like for some reason some bait is great. Like, okay, the jig is just the deal this year, and next year it's a drop shot, next year it's an eco rig. Like, it definitely has a feeling of that. Um, for me, it just comes down to it's super hard for me to just slow drag something when I know I can go crank rock or throw a jerk bait and, and live scope and try to get them to react. So we'll see how Sunday goes. It's supposed to not blow at all. And that initially tells us as, as tournament anglers, like it's probably going to be a tougher bite. So you need to stay off of the piles a little bit off of the rock a little bit and, and probably drag. But I still think they're, they need some sort of reaction deal. Um, so with that and jig fishing, you want to have different weights on while you practice just to see if you can either get that strike on a downfall or you go with the lighter jig and rip it up and snap it um, and see if that's something that can get that um, reaction bite. Because if they're not going to bite a crankbait or a jerkbait and follow it, you have to you have to get them to react a different way. So it's, you said 10 pounds might win it this weekend. No. What do you, what do you think? I should check. Yeah. So last weekend was. We had 11.06, there was 57 votes, and we finished 13th, or either 12th or 13th, and they paid 11 spots. So I think the last check was 11 and a half, and then it was 12, 13, 14, 14, and then got a couple 17, 18 bags and one over 20. Um, but that was decent conditions um unfortunately what's going to happen is it blew a little bit today it's going to blow tomorrow and then saturday night into sunday it's just going to slick off um oh. so there's a tournament tomorrow it'll probably take the 20 plus there's probably i mean it is going to take 20 plus on sunday for sure i just don't know that it's going to be a situation where you can go all right well i'm just going to go crank or i'm going to go throw a jerk bait all day because they're just they're not going to eat that as well as they would if it was blowing eight miles an hour so, well, if you end up winning that, then we're going to have to do a, a last minute <laughs> project. Hey, actually caught him doing this exact thing. I mean, again, it's fishing, dude. We're going to have way too many rods on the deck, probably. Or the opposite. We're going to have two rods on the deck, and we're going to force it and die die by the sword. <laughs> <laughs> but it is the championship, so it's going to be it's going to be a much bigger pay, um, a much bigger payout and stuff. But that's just tournament fishing and time on the water and stuff is, is knowing that if it's post front, low wind, they're still up there. They're not going to go anywhere. It's just going to be a matter of how aggressive are they going to be? And if we have to make them react weird, then that just comes into cadence and line size and all that sort of fun stuff. So. How has the guiding been right now? Has your schedule been pretty full? Yeah, no, it's it's definitely definitely slow. I've had a couple guys the last couple of weeks that are that are tournament guys, um, and we talked about this on the podcast last time. As far as like out of ten people, what's my like spread mm -hmm. of, of anglers? This time of year is definitely where it turns from people visiting. You know, I might have had a couple over Thanksgiving if I was here, but we we ended up going to Texas. But the last two guys were like tournament guys. Hey, I fish a big bass. Can you like help me understand where a big bass would be in March and October and kind of break down the lake and go through more of that kind of training cycle with them? Um, and again, the the first guy we talked for half the trip just on graphing and and what to look for, but I don't even think I think maybe he had two bites and, and missed both of them. Um, and then the next guy went out and caught four the next day. One was a four and a half pounder. So it's that whole, you know, it's it's just not. It's so primed up here to when it's really going to get a cold snap and we see 51 degrees. I think you're going to have a fun three weeks of fishing here before it gets real, real cold. It's such a shame because I love fishing the wintertime. And, you know, I don't even have a lot of good quote unquote wintertime spots for largies, smallmouth. Like, I mean, I smoked almost a five about three over Thanksgiving weekend, smallmouth. Oh. Um, but that's what's so fun is like nobody's on the lake. And you know, when you lean back, it could be an absolute freaking stud. And sure. it's, a sh it's a shame that more people don't understand that. If you go out now, this is when you're going to catch that absolute chode. Yep. Right now. Yep. Yeah, for sure. I mean, they're, 
they're uh, I caught a four and a half pounder today that I literally looked right in his mouth and there's two orange pinchers sticking out that were pretty substantial sized. So, you know, you know what they're doing and it's, it's nature at its finest. I, it, a lot of it's the deer hunting stuff. But yeah. I mean, a lot of these guys don't want to deal with cold, but I mean, it was almost 50 degrees today, bundle up two, three layers, get a good suit. Like you're good to go. Yeah. So no. At, yeah, absolutely. Um, the one thing I wanted to talk about too, since we're getting through that, guys, and I know this is like a little more pre recorded than I usually do, but it's Christmas time. Usually I try to take about a week off and not edit, which is nice to have one week off a year. So uh, I know this is a little after Christmas, but I do know so many people are trying to get prepped and ready for February and March. And this guy is analytical. He keeps all of his rods on one side that are one color, the other side is a different color. He's very organized. So I would really want to pick his brain on how you get prepped. Yep. for either a tournament or for the springtime or, or what have you. Sure. Um, most dudes or I, I would say a lot of dudes up by you probably aren't going to fish. They're just, they're not going to fish right now. Even if there is open water, it's probably tough on the Potomac. It's, you know, the city lakes and stuff like that. Yeah. Maybe you get out, but a lot of the, the winter time for me is pouring, um, getting rid of rust is a huge part of like just buying new tackle boxes if you need to. I probably spend 150 bucks. Hey, this tackle box is super scratched up or it's getting a little bit of rust in it. Even if these companies say like they're rust proof and all this stuff, like you're still going to have situations where um, that's going to happen and a rusty hooks uh, nightmare for even guiding or tournament fishing can, can really heartbreak you. Um, so pouring, porn shaky heads, drop shot weights, all the stuff that I'm going to use in the guide season to just bulk up as much as I can. If it's a rainy day and 40 degrees and I'm not going to go out there, if it's a week like we just had of four days of rain, um, pouring lead, stacking it up, just keeping it to where when I'm guiding five days a week, I don't have to worry about running low on any of that stuff. Um, You have like two separate like tackle for thee, but you know, you know, this for me, like I I don't... I asked so many guys, it's like, so if you're on a jerk bait bite, I don't see you like buying a, a ton of mega bass for the clientele, but maybe in your tournaments, that's kind of what you use. So I'm the opposite, man. I want to give them the best experience. They're throwing what I'm throwing. So if, uh, if they're on a 110 and it's a 12 year old kid, I'm risking it. He can throw it. Like it's part, part. <laughs> yeah, part of the deal. I, I thought about going with Dobbins rods kind of like, Hey, you know, I'll grab Furies and, and Sierras and stuff like that. But no, everyone throws XPs. Um, I want to try to show them the caliber of, of product that you can get in fishing. Um, so some stuff, you know, like, you know, I showed you a crankbait before we got on here, custom painted stuff and stuff that like, I only have a few of, I probably won't, but for the most part, they're going to, they're going to throw what I would throw in a tournament. I, the, the boat's so bogged down with tackle dude. I would hate to have to like go in and out of like trying to switch it and figure out where stuff is. So how long, if you took a week off and you just focus on tackle organization, how long would it take you to reorganize? Yeah. I mean, it would take me a couple full days of really like checking stuff. Uh, another big thing with, with winter fishing too is hooks. So mm-hmm. I'm a stickler, especially on, on crankbaits and jerk baits of changing hooks out. Um, so the mega bass hooks, yeah, they're great, but six pounder is going to bend it out and you're going to cry. So changing, changing hooks out on those, I change hooks out on my custom, um, custom bait stuff and, um, Sometimes you have to play with hook size too, uh, especially in early spring for fall rate on a jerk bait. So you're going to be playing with that stuff a little bit, but basically going out, making sure that I don't have any faulty hooks or um, we've been using the term lately, like ballpoint pen um, hooks and making sure that everything's kind of super tack sharp. Um, I have a few from Gamagatsu that I really like. I like that nano hook. It's their like Matt. Um, Matt Aaron, is that the Aaron Martins one? Yeah. The Aaron Martins comes in that like green pack. It's just, for me, it's so sharp that I can have a drag a little bit looser, and it's gonna pin. It's gonna pin fish. Um, and then on the jerk bait side, it's a little bit stouter than the mega bass hooks, and you know the matness to uh, some of the crankbaits that I throw is really important to me. Is getting all the silver off, so I want to try to go with like split rings that are black or or nickel um, or or darker, and then hooks that are a little bit less of that shiny 
um, kind of shiny feel. So hooks is another great thing to do in the winter. Um, and then just reorganizing just kind of generally everything. Like I have every different crankbait box is based on depths. Well, if I'm in the boat and there's a tackle box close to me, I just throw a crankbait in there. Well, that means a deep diver might be in the shallow running box for six months before I like finally get off my ass and have the time to do it um, and kind of reorganize that stuff. And and lastly, on guiding specifically, I have to do inventory, man. So if I can make it before a Christmas sale for Tackle Warehouse and get 20% off and I know that I need to order 40 packs of 2.8 Kitex, then I'm going to do that to try to save myself a little bit of money where you have to stay on top of that stuff um, to really make sure. And it's the same with with tournament fishing, you know, you're going to throw a Senko. What's your Senkos look like in December? Don't wait until March and realize oh, I only have three bags of green pumpkin and now you're paying 2023 pricing and you missed two sales already for the year um, to try to focus on things like that. Like we were talking about shaky head. What's your Zoom trick worm um, supply kind of look like? What's your robo worms looking like? Kind of those staple things that you know you're going to throw every year. Do your do your inventory in December when it's a cold cold rainy day and, and save yourself some money. It'll it'll save you a lot actually. And and I would also suggest guys and I know this is this would have been great probably before the tackle warehouse sale. Uh, good to know for next year. But yeah, like bulk order your line is a huge thing. So I usually buy um, again. I'm not sponsored by them, but I really like Sunline. Um, my brother likes Power Pro, but that's why he's not here. And with, with Sunline, I always like to go and buy, you know, the four or $500 spools. I think they are the thousand, the thousand yard braid, yep. because then you can just, you can lace up, you know, and I'm doing maintenance right now, my, my small mouth stuff, yep. then you can just lace them all up and, but you're saving a lot of money doing that. Just having that foresight to bulk up. Yeah. hundred percent, hundred percent. Um, Speaking of that too with Sunline, let's talk about these bags super quick because I know we we're going to talk tackle organization a little bit, but um, this is their, it's called a specialist model bag. Okay. But talking about your big line deal, you want to keep your line dry and you want to keep it out in the sun. So this doesn't do the, the 1200 spools or it does 1200. It doesn't do the like thousand or whatever, but just getting organized with stuff like that is is key to in the winter, seeing what your line capacity is at on all your different sizes. Um, if you need braid, you know, I use these bags too for reels. So like you're doing reel maintenance right now, Tom, the same thing, like clean your reels up. If you have more reels than you do rods, then buy one of those bags. That way you have them safe. They're not going to get scratched up. The line that's on them is not going to get messed up and, and just throw it in one of the compartments of the boat. Those, those bags are, are pretty clutch for me with keeping, keep it organized online. So, so how, how do you break down all the boxes? Like, I mean, I guess like what different types of, of boxes do you use? Do you yeah. have specific ones for crankbaits? Do you use like the mafia bags for your soft plastics or just Walmart bins? Like how do you break all yeah. that down? So bass mafia bags for sure for plastics. Um, and then I just put in a uh, boat. I just put in the whole Titan. Yeah. So once tournament season started and it was less, um, it was less guiding. I'll do the Bass Mafia bags for guiding just to have variety in here because with guiding, again, I need to make adjustments like super quick um, where with tournament stuff, I can kind of have a general idea of general idea. Thanks. Well, um, of what's the range of baits I'm probably going to need. And then we can adjust when we get back in the garage. Um, but for me, when it's guiding time, and this one is mega loaded, I shouldn't have it this loaded, but this is basically where I'm keeping swim baits. You can buy a longer one um, to kind of keep more of these clam shells because I don't take my swim baits out. Um, I leave them all in the clams, but Bass Mafia, I have a labeler. I just throw on there like a bag will be curly tail worms, one will be straight tail worms, one will be... Um, one will be flipping baits, one will be tubes. And I'm basically just loading down the back of the boat with like five or six of the Bass Mafia bags. And then I can go in there and grab. And then based on kind of the week, I would say, when I'm guiding that Titan bar is going to get emptied. And then every week I'm just going to kind of pull from the Bass Mafia bags and, and just kind of putting on quick grab on the Titan bar for me to be able to kind of grab what I need. That's the hardest thing to organize, I feel like, is plastics, especially yeah. when it gets into seasonal stuff as well. Like, Yeah, for, for plastics, I have a tackle box 
that's got my robo worms in it because I know I'm always going to grab those. They're straightened out. Like I don't have to worry about the bag bending or anything weird like that. Um, Shatterbait trailers is in a specific tackle box, uh, Carolina rig baits. And then when it's early springtime and stuff, I'll do like my, I'll have like a flipping bait, you know, fighting frogs, D bombs, um, kind of the whole like craw flipping, um, beaver style baits. Mm. That's smart. That's really smart guys. Um, other tackle boxes. Cause I've, I've done a video on YouTube on this one also, and I just ended up buying a new one, but, um, this company's out of Louisiana. I have no affiliation also, but I did a video on this. It's called a Busby. Like, dude, it's like brand new. I still got plastic on the back right here. <laughs> um, is they have this whole like honeycomb design hmm. um, and it's sealed with a gasket. Your terminal tackle will not move. And that's that's always been my number one thing of just annoyance is like, a drop shot weight mixes like all of them spill over into smaller hooks or split rings or whatever and i was just so frustrated by every box i could find um and they definitely solved that dilemma as far as terminal tackle goes so they're super expensive boxes in my opinion i think this tackle box is 50 bucks um which is pretty steep but i use one all year and i just this thing can get run over thrown out the car at 50 miles it can literally like does not matter your your terminal tackle is going to stay where it needs to be and that's efficiency like to the max i am putting one in my tackle warehouse shopping cart right now it's a colony 28 i don't know if tackle warehouse sells them bro i'm looking right now are they better because i think ta uh, tactical bassin was talking about those yeah it might be direct through them but yeah it's a colony 28 is the size um so i think it's the same size as a 3700 or it's either 37 or 36 but 100 percent, no question if someone was like how do i do terminal tackle i will not have another tackle box now it's uh, busby that, colony 28 colony 28 is the size yep it's on sale right now on tackle warehouse 37 dollars. get you too boy you see and that's what i'm going to do right now because guys Honestly, what you need to do is drink and listen to tac uh, the tactical bass and like Black Friday sales because it's a great way to lose money. Or just tell your wives that's just go listen to them for 20 minutes and she'll know seven gifts to buy you. Oh my God, the amount of shit I bought this year is not good. <laughs> it's not healthy. It's just not good, friends. It's just I, not. I spent, I think I spent two grand in a day. Oh, <laughs> but, it, but it, 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 did it on the sale and you're doing that once a year. You just, you just saved yourself some. Yeah, like honestly, like I, I again, and I think that's something that's important to take away from this, guys, is planning, it is to go through all your stuff. I, I listen. I generally my my thing is I strip the boat and then I have my winter stuff, which is usually my big swim bait rods because I pretty much if I'm fishing a lake, I'm dragging a big swim bait from now until like March. But then if I'm fishing rivers, I have my cold river setup, um, and that's it. Everything else gets pulled out, so it makes it very efficient that I know what I'm going to put back in the boat all winter. And then everything else I can just reorganize. That way, when the sales come, I'm efficiently ready to go through that. Because like treble hooks are a big thing. Uh, terminal tackle is huge. Just all the little things that I know I'm going to burn through. Um, and there was something else where I was going to go with this. Oh, do you keep your other jerk baits and crank baits? So what I like to do is I like to take the treble hooks off all my extra jerk baits and stuff. Um, and throw them all in the box because one, they're not tangled, but two, they're not going to rust. Like, how, yep. what, what do you do with rust if that's not how you like organize them? Yeah. So. I'm kind of a bad, bad guy when it comes to the jerk bait stuff, because I just throw them all into a same, like super deep box. There's probably all tangled up together. Um, but a couple things with the rust that I have, I, I assume this works. I have no idea, but, um, I bought off of Amazon, those little pot packets that have like popcorn beads in them that are supposed to keep it like fresh hmm. or anti-rust supposedly. And I put one of those in all of my tackle boxes could com be a complete scam for six bucks. Um, but I tried that. And the only thing that I've had rust this year and it was a mistake by me was some of my swim bait heads are, are a little rusty. That's just for me grabbing a swim bait right off and just putting it right back in the box, not letting it dry um, and, and doing that. Plano does have in their um, 
whatever their yellow box version is, they have a little like rusto anti rust square um, that they put in their boxes. So I don't personally love that box, um, but I've pulled those rust things out of there and put them in like the deep crank box has one. Um, my like fall crankbait one has has those. So number one is try to dry your baits. So don't cut one off like I do sometimes. I try to put them on the magnet bar, let them dry overnight before I put them back in, or I have a step in my ranger here. Just kind of use that as like a little area to to put the baits um, to make sure that they don't um, they don't rest rust up everything else. Um, and then like for me on the swim bait box, that's that's kind of a mess. I think what I'm going to do next year is not going to pull my guppy heads out of their bags. Mm-hmm. Um, they come pretty packed. I think I'm just going to buy a deeper tackle box and and just kind of row them out. Um, and that way that will also help me inventory with, hey, I have I'm down to three bags of this size. So I know I have nine left um, or 12 left and put in put in an order if I need to or run to the tackle store. So that's smart. Definitely, there, there's a few kind of things that you can do for the rust thing. But I would say if, if you're getting into fishing or you're maybe buying more expensive baits, like let's say you buy, you're buying your first kind of set of mega bass ones, um, invest in a good tackle box. Don't go for the cheapest one that's got no gasket seal on it or anything like that because 100% you would fish on a rainy day or they get damp somehow. And those, those types of baits will rust real quick in a cheap tackle box. Yeah. And rust will absolutely ruin your day. Yeah. It's just, it's just, you're, you're just wasting money at that time. You're just first, you're just burning money. So, um, another thing, this one will be somewhat comedic for anyone who's watching on YouTube. I'm not a fan of an A rig, but I have to have it because I have to is I found these weird tubes to How's your A rings? So that looks like something else. Angle all your stuff up and <laughs> it. Um, it's an A rig. I don't remember what these are called. You can find them on Tackle Warehouse because that's where I got them. Actually, it says it right here. The Rig Wrangler. Sound, yeah. It's sounds like you. assless chaps to me, buddy. Brought uh, to you by Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve or Tackle Warehouse. <laughs> Um, but for example, here's a monster Picasso a rig. I think there's nine more baits in there. Um, I just put it in a much deeper tackle box and you're, you're protecting your tackle. You're protecting the tackle box. Um, even when we're running down the lake, if I know I'm not going to throw that a rig for a little while, I will leave this on just to help make sure that I'm not having seven rods tangled up in an a rig. Um, so that's, that's been kind of a clutch a clutch uh, organization piece for me for the winter, for sure. It, if you're going to have to throw those, just pick up a, I think they come in a pack of two, but you could probably make it yourself um, if you didn't want to spend the 10, 12 bucks. But for me, it's like, it, it was just an easy buy to be able to organize these things because I hate having them on the deck. Why don't you like the A-Rig? It's twofold for me. First is like uh, from the heart. It's a conservation thing. Me being from Minnesota and like, I don't know. I just, I was brought up with like, don't fish during the spawn and like let them lay their eggs and all that stuff is like, when I see somebody catch a seven pounder, but there's two hooks in her belly past the barb and a hook in her eye. I just feel like, did that really like need to happen to that fish um, for somebody to, for somebody to catch it in that way. So I have like a weird moral thing with it slightly with some of these fish are definitely getting damaged from an A-Rig. And then secondly, for as much as I fish and as much as I love live scope, I have never had a stellar day on an A-Rig. I've never had a like, oh my gosh, I caught two sevens today. I don't even know if I have one over four and a half pounds on an A-Rig, which is insane because I can put it on top of their face um, and put it right past them, even if they're 50, 60 feet deep. I have just never had the success that um, that some guys have had. And yeah, that's fine. I lose for the month of February, maybe, if they get the right wind and the right water color. But I have had a million better days on a Demiki rig, a 2.8, or a jerkbait. Yeah, it's so weird because if... 
maybe guys, maybe we'll also I'll probably do a live stream about this too, where I can just vent because I think if my memory serves me timeline, it was it was the A rig became popular before forward facing sonar got as huge as Correct. It, it was Garmin's first iteration, but it wasn't very good. So really the that was the original live scope for catching all those schooling fish was the A rig. But then I know it caught on like fire and the bite went away. And again, yep. that kind of gets back to, I think, what we've been talking about, where I feel like with the jig, chatterbait, and even the umbrella rig, it's just, those things get, fish get conditioned to them big time. Yeah, so, I mean, dude, you still see, like, I mean, Josh Jones, dude, whales on him in Oklahoma on an A-Rig. Like, it's still definitely, it's still yeah. definitely a thing. Um, but I not, think, not like it used to be. As, as soon as it came out, I think they got conditioned. Like, Paul Elias... Will and I were just talking about it. It was September when it became popular. It wasn't winter. Um, and then all of a sudden, Will lives in Charlotte. We were seeing like all of a sudden Norman bags went from like 15 pounds of spots to being like, you get someone one with 28 pounds off the bridge. And it's like, okay, well, the only thing that's come out in the last six months was the A rig. And then you find out everybody and their brothers throwing it is I definitely think they're getting to condition to it. I had the idea a long time ago of, what could you do to minimize the wire? And I actually had an Instagram ad the other day. It's way too expensive for, for me and I hate the A-Rig, but a clear wired A-Rig. And they made it out of like a weird plastic substance and it definitely breathes a lot more, um, but it's clear. So there's no, you run your line through these wire pieces and it keeps your, your bait separated and it's clear. I could see that maybe as an, an iteration of the A-Rig to being great, but at Smith, Bugs is a little bit different. You can go down there and catch 14 inches on it all day long. They're stupid. But for me here, I have never had the urge or the feeling of I'm going to go out with an A-Rig and I'm going to catch a seven pounder on an A-Rig versus I'm going to go catch a seven pounder on a jerkbait. Yeah, it's so freaking weird to me because I, I really think it comes down to with, with, with forward facing sonar being the way it is, I, I truly believe the fish are starting to feel the boat pressure when you're, when you're watching them. And then when they see the chandelier come down, they're putting two and two together. Yep. And I really think that's kind of what's happening here. And it's all, it's so funny because it's almost like everything's becoming more finessey. And I think we talked about this too. I'm huge into Which, Japanese yeah. culture, keeping up with that where, yeah, it's the Tamiki rig. Now it's coming out with that, that new, uh, I don't know what it's called. Fukushima thing where you, where you have the 90 degree line tie stuck in a fluke with a nail weight. I forget the name of it, but yeah. anyways, but, but yeah, like these fish, even though you have that forward facing sonar guys, they can feel you. They know you're there. Um, they're getting really smart to it. Yeah, we have been talking about that um, a lot recently, too, on what's going on with, say, spoonfish. Um, you know, you put your A scope on on your 2D five years ago and you just go over a school of bass in 30 feet and you'd get bites. I you see them follow it to the boat you see them do everything they sit right under the boat even with live scope and they're just not eating it like they they have in the last three four years but this is where i will say too it's like i feel like i'm hearing that from like a lot of different regions um not just like hey your lake's overpressured. um i feel like i'm just hearing it from a lot of different places and sometimes i think um sometimes i just think in in general we don't know enough about fish for it to be like, Hey, the fluke is super good this year. And for some reason, the fluke is working everywhere, like well, yeah. working, working in New York. And then two years from now, it's like, you can't get a bite on one. Yes. I, I think we truly do not know enough about fish behavior, but also if you look at the timeline when it was just Garmin that had it. Right. And, and then what Lawrence came out with it two years ago, I yeah. think two years ago and then hummingbird finally came out with theirs so now pretty much if you bass fish from a boat well, no matter what brand you have it yeah and the company i keep and probably you keep they are also the people that are probably going to have it too so it kind of makes sense that you're starting to hear that almost everyone that fishes tournaments is going to have it because you're at a disadvantage if you don't yep. and i truly think that they're educated enough where they're like hey listen when that boat pulls over our heads now beforehand it wasn't an issue now all of a sudden we're getting plucked and yeah. Down. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I'm definitely seeing stuff like if you throw the drop shot right on top of their head, they're not eating it like they were three years ago. You have to cast past them and pull it up to, to pull it up to where they're at, kind of back to normal. But I know for us on Sunday, we've already basically made the decision the live scope's not turning on. So we're gonna kind of like I said, die by the sword, just run shallow rock and hope that the full moon's gonna have our back and and just do that. And I, I don't need live scope if I'm fishing in six feet um to see if one's up there i'm just going to make the assumption and, and have the confidence that that's what they're doing so i think we're going to leave honestly we're talking about leaving all the graphs off um i think there's something to that man i really do i mean i i had this epiphany the other day where we were fishing a shallow river um and we were fishing these major seams for, for winter smallmouth but because you could visually see it you kept the boat away and i wonder how much of it does come down to just boat control and understanding like okay if you have your garmin set to let's say 80 feet, like that might not be enough. Now you might need to set that thing or get the new one. That's like 400 feet or whatever, but it's almost like you need more distance now. For sure. Them. sure. Yeah. We'll, we'll see. Uh, I'll probably, I'll probably turn it off for the next couple of weeks just because I think they're still going to be shallow until we hit like 50 degrees. Um, but then, you know, I mean, we'll do another podcast. I'll let you know how like the jerkbait stuff goes as far as if that I, I need, I need it for jerkbait stuff just to, for my mind. Um, it's too, it's too good to not have it on. So, so before forward facing sonar, the jerkbait really was something we'd use year round to kill it in college tournaments because it was the forward facing sonar. You could search for it. Yep. I, I guess where I'm going with this question is, is this the other, this is this an issue with live scope where now you've lost the confidence where like before I had live scope, I just, you just fish jerk bait. I had no issue with it. Now it's right, you go like, to a, it's crack. Yeah. You go to a windmill and point and be like, okay, there's probably a fish up there. And now it's like you drop live scope and you're like, there's no fish move. Yeah. Um, I would tell everyone if you're getting to a point where you don't have like instinct to go fish a specific bait because you know that's what is probably going to work without front facing sonar you need to go do some trips without it um like i try to go out there and not turn it on when i'm fun fishing which is tough for me to do but like will definitely um definitely puts me to the test to make sure that i'm turning it off or that i'm facing it away at a minimum um so i, I think it's probably going to be a little bit more next year of like, Hey, I'm just going to go out and go fishing now. Um, and just make the assumption and kind of rebuild that grit, but you definitely don't want to lose that because then you're going to stop enjoying fishing. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's really interesting. And maybe we'll do a more in-depth, um, we'll do a more in-depth live scope, uh, video at some point, guys. Um, the, the one thing jerk bait wise, what are your top two jerk baits when it comes to just depth? Like, are, are you going to be fishing a shallow and a deep? Are you having both tied on? Or yeah. You just have so I'll just go with what I'm probably going to go with on Sunday is a 110 plus one. Um, just because I can do the rod tip up high and keep it shallow enough. And then if I want to try to get it down, you can sling it and get it down into seven to ten. Um, and they're at least this week, they're looking up. So if they're in 25 feet and I can get it down to nine they'll come up for it um or at least come up to look at it and then the other bait that i'm throwing is it's from lucky craft i don't know what the bait number is but it's one of their largest jerk baits um just to try to throw a big big profile jerk bait so trying it i don't know if it's necessarily a thing but we, we play with that size kind of like we're talking about japanese culture sometimes they'll throw a very small jerk bait on a spinning rod um, and get clobbered. But the 110 to me is like the all around best jerk bait. It's the right profile size for a big one to eat it, a little one to eat it. Um, play with your colors a little bit and uh, and your hooks, but out the box, they're, they're, I think they're almost impossible to beat. Color is a big thing. I, I truly, with a jerk bait too, people don't appreciate how important I, I personally think color is to getting them to finally commit to that thing. Yep. Now with a partner though, Will, how do you guys actually break the boat up in a team tournament? Do you guys, are you guys both on the front fishing the same bait? Or are you working different columns? Uh, 
if we know they're on a specific bait, we'll both throw the same bait. But in most cases, we're throwing different things. Um, Will's cool with throwing a drop shot all day, throwing a shaky head. Like he's fine playing cleanup man. Um, I would say it just depends on the structure. Like if we're fishing a very small specific spot, he's up on the front deck. So we don't have a problem doing it. If we're both cranking or he's throwing a jerk bait and I'm cranking or, um, you know, kind of just going down the bank. He's up in the front. If it's a situation where we got schoolers in top water, he'll be on the back and we'll just be able to kind of rotate our heads around. He's usually just grabbing the net. Um, but uh, Will, you want to fact check that? Yeah, he said he said he nets his own fish. <laughs> um, but yeah, we're we're good tournament partners, dude. We we um I don't know if we talked about this in the in the last podcast, but like Brian Thrift, um, like we'll say that term to each other where it's like we need to move faster or we need to kind of like change our area. We're big on if we don't get a bite for a couple hours here, let's make a run um, and have it be a 10 minute run minimum, switch rivers, go to the lower end, go find dirty water, like do something to shake it up. Um, and, and so that's where we kind of play well off each other of we're both pretty analytical, but we'll both keep each other straight as far as, um, you know, we need to move or we need to change something up. So, uh, Will, Will, uh, I know you can hear me. Um, what is your best technique or what do you think is more of your strength? So you, you're allowed to speak. There you go. Yes. I appreciate it. Thank you, Bill, for letting me, speak. <laughs> um, and, uh, not getting that, but yeah, definitely, uh, we are either power or finesse. So it's either a crankbait or jerkbait or a spinning rod with a drop shot or shaky head. Those are, if we're going to have the best chance to win, that's, that's where it's going to be. And how, how do you guys come to a decision? Like, are you just going to argue like a couple, like in the moment? Cause like, Hey, I fished with my brother from high school all the way through college. Like we yep. got in all those fist fights when it came to the next spot. Or is it like, Hey, listen, this is your strength. I'm going to concede to you that this is probably the best thing to do in this situation. Here's what our wives would say. <laughs> we beat talking about fishing like a straight up dead horse that's been dead for three weeks and we just beat it up. We Will and I probably talk three times a day, every, almost every day, whether it's me being out on the water, like what's going on or work stuff or whatever. But if we're coming up on tournament mode, we're talking probably three, four times a day. Um, ideas, what's the weather looking like, wind direction, a spot we haven't looked at in a while, um, Will's got access to my waypoint. So if he wants to sit at the couch at home and be like, Hey, have we ran to this spot recently? Um, so we don't really bicker. I, honestly, we, <laughs> we don't, we don't bicker. If more, it's like, um, mutual respect. Yeah. It's more a mutual respect of like, we both know what we need to do. Will was very competitive back when he was, when he was fishing hard. Um, so I know he knows what he needs to do or how we need to adjust. So I get in my head, he gets in his head and, and like tomorrow specifically, we're, we're doing two boats tomorrow to practice and, and split. Them. Um, so we'll base it on, we'll base it on what areas are kind of alive and who gets some bigger bites. If we can get multiple bigger bites, we're probably going to do no hooks for more than half the day tomorrow, just cause it's. If it is only going to take 18 pounds to get a good check, I don't want to jack a five pounder tomorrow. Um, and so, you know, tomorrow we'll talk multiple times, but yeah, it's more of, of brainstorming constantly. It's not a like, Hey bro, I'll just see you at the ramp and we'll figure it out. We're, we're pretty um, analytical and talking about it. And like I told you last time, fishing notes, Will's on my notepad on my phone. So if I keep that up to date, we're able to kind of brainstorm and play off of each other and, come up with kind of unique ideas so how did you two meet feels like it's a dating app now yeah i know <laughs> well like no because like this is important because like 90 percent of people out there actually fish team tournaments they don't actually go fish the best client like, last week the guy's only been fishing for five years he's in his 50s he's like i'm struggling to find a partner he's like i want to fish tournaments like how should i find a partner and I'm walking them through like you know you can do the clubs and and, and do stuff like that but he kind of had this weird feeling of um, you know, do I share my spots with a new guy? Like, how do I kind of do that at, at that age? So we got introduced by a guy named Darren 12 years ago, maybe. 
um, down when I lived in North Carolina. And then I fished with Darren a few times. And then I don't think you and I, I don't even remember when I met you at first face to face. Was it here? Randleman. Randleman. We fished Randleman Lake in North Carolina. Hmm. Um, and then we've just fished pretty much forever since then. Um, and then what's funny is Will grew up in Lynchburg, but his dad lives at Smith Mountain. I now live literally like one mile away from his dad. Like we could walk there and be on a call with you. So, um, yeah, so kind of full circle. Like I basically am living where Will lived until or got to visit and hang out till he was 18 or so and left for college. So just brotherly love, bro. <laughs> No, it, it it's really good because, you know, I mean, luckily, I mean, or unluckily, you know, I had a brother and so we kind of got paired up together to do a lot of fishing. But the one thing is like the drama and we saw this even in high school, college and then after that with, with finding a good partner and then sharing spots and then actually like there's a lot of drama to finding a good partner and, sure. and having that work. Yeah. I mean, what do you think people and you talked about that one individual, what do you think you should look for? So social media is awesome. It's a good way to do it. Um, I would. There's a dating app now. <laughs> it, it, fast fishing dating app. What I would say is, if if you can approach it in the form of you're not gonna just fish tournaments with this person, is probably a better way to do it. Like, hey, let's become buds and just fish. Um, you know, for example, Will and I obviously have other friends at the lake that we have fished with for a long time, fished tournaments with, and everything like that. I would say, as far as me and Will fishing, we're not gonna take. We know we're not going to mutually respect wise take anybody to like the A plus plus stuff. Like that's just for me and Will. Um, but we also respect each other in the form of like, dude, I'm not going to fish tournament with you for six months, and those fish aren't going to be there when we fish the next tournament because it's the wrong pattern. Go fish the A stuff. Go fish the B stuff. Um, and I've I've told you this before too, just through text and everything else. There's so much stuff in this lake. I could show a hundred people all the different spots. And I probably wouldn't have to worry about spots. Um, there's that much good stuff here. So I would say approaching more of like, hey, do you just want to go fishing and make sure like the personalities vibe? Um, and then on the tournament side, clubs is super important. There's people that are co-anglers in there that want to learn and fish with as many people as possible. So you may find somebody that doesn't even own a boat that you click with and now all of a sudden you guys are buddies and you're just the boat guy. Cause I think a lot of guys are hesitant with the form of like, we both own boats. Whose boat are we using? Um, I don't want to show you this spot cause I found it and we're not super tight yet. So then when you go fish your tournament, you guys aren't working, actually working together. You're working against each other to try to find new stuff. That's not your prime stuff, um, which doesn't help anybody. I usually like to be pretty honest and direct in the form of like, hey, I know we fish tournaments against each other. If I take you to this spot, I have a tournament in two days. I'd really appreciate it if you would not fish this tomorrow. And I don't want to see you here on Sunday. Um, cool after that. And if you get to it first in the next tournament next year, whatever, that's totally fine. But hey, I'm on something good. And like, this is a this is a good spot for me. Can you lay off of it? If the dude tells you, nah, I'm going to go fish your stuff anyways, then you should kick them in the nabs and push them overboard. But if, if in most cases, it's just a normal dude, they'll respect that to the point. They know it took you time to find the stuff. Um, but yeah, I could see sibling drama, dude. I, I definitely would not necessarily want to do the sibling route. Um, I just think, I think that's a necessarily a no go, but if you're the opposite, if you're on the co side, like I'm putting on Instagram right now, trying to find codes to link for the, for the BFLs and stuff like that is um, club is great. Fish with as many local dudes as you can before you buy a boat or before you think about getting into tournament stuff, because you're a co-angler. They want everybody to have fun. There's ABA level, there's local level, there's TBF, like there's smaller 20, 30, 40 boat tournaments that are great for somebody to jump in and just meet the community. Everyone's, relatively chill in the fishing community in my opinion too even if you're competing against one another it's not a um hey you're on my spot get off my spot you know type deal 
Yeah, and and we'll definitely chime in here if you got something, if you got a different point of view or whatever. But to me, it's also where you guys are located with, with, with Smith and Kerr. They're not as they don't condense the field as much as the title Potomac does. And I think you don't get that weird Jersey traffic jam vibe and Matter Woman in the spring. And, and I could be wrong and just throw it in there if I'm, I'm wrong, but that's gotta be something that helps you out is like you said, there's a lot of shit in that lake to spread the field out. I mean, we barely even see boats. Some tournaments we look at each other and we're like, where the hell is everybody? <laughs> well, we have a decent bag. So we're like, all right, well, we'll just keep doing this, I guess. Um, is, yeah, it's a lot of local dudes that have fished here a long time. They're generational anglers. Their grandpa built the dam. Their dad fished it and guided, and now they're just fishing. Um, good camaraderie here. It's definitely very like, let's all enjoy the lake. It's it's beauty. The fishing's great. Everyone's catching. Where yeah, the Potomac sets up. Just take the Jersey Shore part out of it. Okay there's one grass flat that has all the fish in it. There's going to be 85 boats that are all going to punch the same grass flat all day. You're going to run into dudes that have four keepers and need one more keeper and watch you catch a five when you cut them off. That's, that's a whole different, that's a whole different story. Me personally, I would never get upset about something because we're talking about fishing. Um, but that's also just a perspective on life. I think, um, I just talked to a buddy that fished the national championship at Hartwell talking about the same thing. It sounded like there was a few banks down there where people pulled up and there's nine boats on one point fishing for the same suspended spots. Like, so I just think that that stuff, that, that, that stuff happens. I will say being from Minnesota, it's definitely regional, like, uh, New Jersey, no like offense against you in New York, but you guys got some bad attitudes. I'm sure it's the cold and the traffic, but, um, but I'll say it, it. It's because of where you're from. It, yeah. It's because you guys are assholes. So anyway, yeah. I'll say it. <laughs> so they're nice and passive. So no, it's that's it's good stuff. And I think it's honestly, it's such a weird. I had somebody, I had somebody like message me the other day, being like, I didn't like this person you had on the show because he gave up too much information of the spot. And it's like I fished there. It's like first off, that's why I have the show is I didn't even know that was a damn spot. Yeah. Second off, it, it's grow up like i'm i'm really sorry about this but the whole idea that you know one spot then you're not a good fisherman yeah i'm I'm really sorry but it's just like you got to think of it this way if i know that there's a grass flat in matta woman and i win a tournament there and i and i show it to you guess what there's two things that are gonna happen there one that spot's not gonna be good forever because it's grass okay so that that's gonna change yearly but two if i have to rely on that spot completely and if I mentally, and this is why I tell myself, this is why guys, you know, with me, I burn spots if I do well in a tournament, because then I mentally don't have to worry about that spot anymore. It's done. Jacob Wheeler taught me this too, about how he fishes, because guess what? Whether you tell somebody or not, somebody's going to see you fish it. Yep. Somebody will always, someone's always watching. And whether sure. you tell somebody or not, and then all of a sudden you go back there next tournament and you don't know why a spot's not good. It's because somebody else just poached it. And, and again, title Potomac, that happens all the freaking time. But if you have this mindset that it's like a secret spot, I uh, really think that mentally hurts you. Yep, it's not. Um, on top of, I mean, dude, I have people all the time out on the lake here. It's pretty obvious. I have 10-foot raptors on the back of my boat. I'm <laughs> yeah, flag poles. Like, I'm the flagpole guy. Uh, I mean, I have dudes sometimes when I during the middle of the week that I hear them beeping on their unit. Like, I can hear them marking on what I'm on they have no idea what I'm on. I mean, Thomas, some of the stuff I'm fishing is the size of a basketball, like hard spots, like little dips and stuff. They'll never find it. They'll never set up the boat right on it. They can, they can kind of graph that I'm on a long point all day long. Are they going to take the time to set up and graph over it six times to figure out where I'm at, know when it's good and figure that not a chance, not a chance. Um, and then on top of that, great. They found a brush pile. Go, a hundred yards, there's going to be another brush pile. Um, and then on top of that with live scope and what you just learn is eight out of 10 times, those fish aren't going to eat anyways. So those guys aren't going to be at those, you know, those guys aren't out. Uh, it's time on the water, right? Like for me, it's perspective wise, right? Do I care? No, because I'm going to be out three more days this week. I'll find something else to fish. If you're an angler and you only get to fish twice a month and it's your brush pile, you've caught your big ones out of it. I could see where you get a little emotional about it. Uh, but that's just a perspective and teaching yourself that you're a better fisherman than you think you are. And 
um, and, and go that route. So I would not try to get in the habit of being butthurt about um, somebody being on your spot that you either showed or talked about on a podcast or whatever, because they're not going to fish it the same way as you. We have a saying in, in the boat, me and Will say it all the time. We're not going to go fish for anybody else's fish. You can't do it the same way they did it. They twitch it differently. They run it differently. They do something different. You're never going to know what that is. Um, and so just stick to your gut, stick to your guns and, and just don't be a dick. And I'm going to put that on a t-shirt. You should right with your flagpole. What did I say? Stick to your stick to your guns, stick to your whatever. Don't be a dick. Yeah, stick to your guns. Don't be a dick. Uh, with thread the needle or something. But I think you said that offline, so we'll we'll save that for the after hour show. <laughs> no, good good stuff. I mean, you know, I mean, we've covered a lot as always, guys. And then you know, ne- next episode we're gonna do a full lake fishing report once the lake completely settles down, gets into established pattern, and we'll start talking about some more wintertime baits. And then we have to have a big swim bait show because I've I've needed somebody to talk about big swim baits with to just yeah. settle that itch. So um, I will tell you too, we'll have to do a special when I leave for El Salto on Monday. Oh shit. That's right. I forgot about that. That's awesome. So, I don't know. I'm taking drop shot stuff, bro. Oh, come on. You're not going to be taking the big stuff. I am taking big stuff too, but I'll definitely throw a drop shot around. Those fish have never, I I mean, they've probably seen it, but I don't think they've seen 10 pound line, six inch robo worm stuff. So no, probably much a Coke can and some string. Probably. I talked to my buddy today. He said, dude, we should probably, we'll be catching between 40 and 60 fish a day. And I was like, well, I'll definitely throw, I'm going to throw some big glides and big worms and, and jigs and Senkos and stuff like that. But if I'm going to be up shallow and there's some stumps and stuff, I'm going to, I'm going to try chucking around a little drop shot and see what happens. We'll see if I can catch a 10 on a drop shot down there. What, what is going to be a good, what is going to be considered a good trip? I've been there. He has been there three times. He said averaging 40 fish a day, we should each catch one between like seven and nine like all three to fives all day long. And then the link record's 19. So mm. we'll see. Uh, we'll see how crazy would it be if I caught like a 17 on a drop shot or something stupid. Why would you want to do that? <laughs> My poor heart. I wouldn't just say that I did it, but I'm going to try to go pro as much as I can and, and, and make a decent video on it. But uh, we got the tournament Sunday and then I'm stripping the boat and packing everything I can to, to be in sunny Mexico. So we'll have to do, we'll have to do one on that dude and I'll get to the media and stuff. We can play with that. No, that, that'd be fun. Cause yeah, that dude, enjoy that. Like, yeah, hopefully you can catch a P. Oh, what is your PR by the way? I guess before Janet, what is it? So on a scale is nine forty three from Florida in February, but Will and I definitely did a sneaky kayak trip seven years ago seven years ago and we got on an s waiver bite by a dam where we're pretty sure will caught like a seven eight and mine was much bigger than that um and i got we talking largey or smally large mouth and i've got a picture of it with the seven inch s waiver on it and the seven inch s waiver is like just past his gill plate so it it's a stud as far as length wise. And she was super fat. So, um, yeah, we, we didn't get to measure that one. So dude, that's freaking awesome. Yeah. That's I, the story we got to hear. So, it was, it was so stupid. Well, I mean, you know, Billy, I really thank you so much for coming back on the show. Again, guys, this is Smith Mountain Lake Fishing Guide Service. Link, of course, in the episode description to all of his information. Please book a guide trip with him in the future. Um, is there anything else that, you know, we want to touch bases on? Uh, no, man. Yep. Guys, again, please like and subscribe to the channel. We'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.